you. I appreciate um, the opportunity to be able to speak today and to talk about design outreach. And thank you for the wonderful introduction. Design outreach is a humanitarian engineering nonprofit organization tackling some of the toughest problems facing developing countries. And so one of the first problems that we tackled was one that deals with water, which is access to clean, safe, reliable, and sustainable water for about 800 million people in the world in developing countries. Before I jump into too much here, let me show a quick video. Giving a, a brief overview of design outreach and the life on water pump program. Water. Those small, it can eat away at our lives, take away our future, our health, our options, broken down. Our wells couldn't reach deep enough. The pumps weren't strong enough. We needed a well that could reach deeper, hundreds of feet deeper. A well that could last longer and give clean water to rural communities around the world. Design Outreach took the challenge to rethink the possibilities. More than 30 professionals, hundreds of hours of design, tests, and strategies. The result? Life Pump. It's more than just a machine. It's empowerment. Working with nationals, even sending feedback on how the pump is working. It's not about doing enough. It's about designing a solution. What problem will we solve next? So this all began back in 2006. I was working as a junior engineer, mechanical engineer in product development and equipment development at Battelle, which is a very large think tank organization located here in Columbus. And I went on a short-term missions trip with my church to a, a country in Central Asia, and it had nothing to do with water or engineering. But when I was there, I had this, this tremendous realization that there's a lot of people in the world who are without basic necessities, things like food and water and shelter, a way to make money. I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if a think tank like Patel with all these wonderful engineers and scientists came together and tackled some problems that were facing most of the world? So I came back to my cubicle. I um, started brainstorming how this would be done. I started reading some books, inspired by several different books, and, and realized that all of my colleagues at Patel had a very similar interest, that they wanted to donate and volunteer their hours, their professional time, to try to solve some of these problems. And we realized that we needed our first major project, and we wanted to really hear from the field what would be the biggest problem to tackle. If we could tackle anything, what would it be that would save the most amount of lives and help the most amount of people? And so we ended up getting in touch with an organization called ICDI. They operate in the Central African Republic, which if you've been watching the news, the Central African Republic has been in the news, and that's very usually a very unfortunate thing. They're in the middle of a civil war again. Um, this organization goes into communities, they help develop the community. So these are communities that are extremely poor, um, absolutely almost nothing, including water or food, barefoot, um, dirt floors, palm roof type of, of huts that they live in. And the, the organization will go in and the first thing they do is put in a water source, because water is the source of everything. The first thing they do is put in a water source and give them clean water and it improves their health, of their ability to get educated, and a whole variety of things. Well, we talked to the director of this organization and asked him, what's the biggest problem that we can solve for you? And almost immediately he said, well, we need a water pump that will last longer than what we currently have and will reach deeper than what's currently available. And of course we thought that would be a simple problem to solve. We thought, of course, somebody's already done this before. We're not the first ones to develop a water pump and we're not the first ones to, to realize this need. So we did a very large, massive product search. We did the best that we could as, as first world engineers that we knew about at the time, and discovered that there is nothing that was out there. There's a lot of reasons for this. The, the world sort of shifted towards a disposable mentality of creating water pumps that are relatively inexpensive, uh, but are very um, susceptible to breaking down. So for instance, with ICDI, when they go into a village, they have to go back at least every six months to do a repair. And so they try to do this in a way that it's really a maintenance run, 
where their preventative maintenance prevents the pump from actually completely breaking. So what do you do for a week or a month without water if you suddenly didn't have water? And they told us if we could just go back once a year versus twice a year, not only would it improve the health of the community because there wouldn't be downtime between failures, but it would drastically reduce their costs. See, in a place like the Central African Republic and most of the developing world, there's a lot of these projects that are installed using resources from rich countries like the United States. And then there's no little or no follow-up going back to the community. And so the, most of the time what happens is the community is like <coughs> themselves. So let's say you have a water pump that's installed and it works really well for six months, and all of a sudden it breaks. It's usually a 50 cent or maybe even a $5 part, which is affordable by the village. The village collectively uh, brings together their money, they have a water council, they um, pay for a maintenance crew that can come by. However, the problem is, is getting that $5 part out to this rural village. It could cost literally three or four or $500 in fuel and trucking costs to get out to these difficult areas. And this is most of the world when we're talking developing country. Most, most of these places are, are dirt roads with huge ruts, so you need a four-wheel drive vehicle, places where every part for that truck is being imported, so you can see where the costs start to build up. And what ends up happening, the village ends up abandoning the well. Um, even though a tremendous amount of resources went into building that well, they ended up abandoning it because of a $5 part in many cases. There was a study, and of course statistics out of Africa are very difficult to, to, to collect. There's been a lot of attempts. Um, there's a study from a few years back from the Rural Water Supply Network that says there's approximately 350,000 hand pumps installed in Sub-Saharan Africa. But out of those 350,000, and each pump, of course, they, it serves a village or a community of about three to 500 people. So out of all those 350,000, 125,000 are broken. So these are wells that were installed at great expense and now are abandoned and broken because of usually a $5 part. And so we, we said, we gotta fix this. Uh, and we couldn't find a pump that replaced these, these uh, pumps that weren't working. We had no choice to build, but to build our own. So how do you do that? And so we started by these brown bag lunches around the, the, the lunch room at Patel and said, okay, we've got to be able to figure this out. This can't be that difficult. Of course, we discovered it's a lot more a bigger of a problem than a hardware problem. As, as I think our, our previous speaker mentioned, uh, there's a lot of social aspects and a lot of business aspects that have to go into this. So what we did is created this nonprofit, this, this coalition of partnerships, essentially, called Design Outreach. Design Outreach brings together all of the major players in this arena. So for instance, academic partners like Ohio State, and we have other partners like Messiah College, the University of Denver that's working with us. Great research institutions really understand how to solve problems, but lack the connection to the developing world or the NGO that's doing the implementation. And you have industry partners. Industry is really interested in entering emerging markets. Industry wants to create our products and send it to these massive emerging markets to make great profit. However, they lack the humanitarian engineering expertise to do so, and they're really risk adverse. So they would rather focus on products they know they'll get a good return, even if it would save a lot of lives. So a lot of the major, the biggest industries are trying, but are still struggling with this. Um, and of course, there's nonprofits. So nonprofits, other nonprofits, such as World Vision. World Vision is one of our great partners right now. World Vision operates in 110 different countries. So they're the biggest non-governmental organization in the world at the moment. And they have great presence in all these countries. Most of their employees are indigenous. These are people from the countries they work in. And they raise a tremendous amount of money. They raise most of that money on the United States and then Europe and Japan and some other rich countries. And they give that money to these countries, the developing countries, to do the work, to do the products. However, organizations like World Vision, they lack sort of a research and development wing. They don't hire, they can't hire, they're not able to hire a team of engineers to go in and redesign and rethink and innovate. Instead, they have to buy what's off the shelf. And so when we start talking to places like World Vision and Living Water International and ICDI and others, they're extremely excited. They said, for the first time, somebody's thinking outside the box and really working at developing a new solution We'd love to work and you can pilot that with you. And then of course there's donors. Donors drive this whole mechanism. There's a lot of very generous donors out there, but donors want to know that their money is being leveraged, that their resources, their gifting kind, whatever service they're providing. This goes to not only our volunteers, but, but also people who give cash. They want to see 
that they give a dollar that's being leveraged and really helping a lot more people. So we created this, this coalition, and this really works well. And we did this to tackle this water pump issue. But it's not business as usual. We really take and evaluate the needs and wants from the field. So this isn't just first world engineering, trying to apply that to a developing country construct, but instead trying to understand getting in the field, getting the feedback, designing, building, iterating until it's done and it's done right. And that's where we solve the problem. So one of these trips, we were in Malawi last summer. So this is from Northern Malawi. We're working with some of our partners here from World Vision on the right hand side. On the left, uh, one of our, our volunteers, Tom, he's actually from Battelle. Tom is a 25 year veteran. These are the kind of highly motivated, highly skilled people that we have working with us. We have about 40 or so individuals representing about a dozen different companies. Tom works at Patel. He has about 22 patents to his name, and he was named the inventor of the year two years ago. And he's our technical lead for the light pump program. So we're extremely blessed with the tremendous knowledge base and resources and depth of experience to solve these problems. And so we're really excited about how this goes. We went to, to Malawi to do an exploratory mission to pilot with World Vision. And while we're there, their wash manager, which is in, in the white, uh, the gentleman in the white there, the polo, he said, you're engineers, I have this other problem for you. I want you to go and look at this other area. And so he took us up to a project that they, they've been working on. It's over budget, it's over timeline, it's not going well. And he said, come in and help us figure out this problem. So we went up there and spent the day. We did some troubleshooting. We came back and we did what we do best with that coalition. We organized three or four partners together. And now, in two months, a team is going back to solve this problem. So that was really exciting that we got to help out, even though we're not in the business of this is a large pipeline project. We were in the business of, of talking about water pumps, but we truly care about all the needs in one. So speaking of industry partners, one of our great partners in this endeavor is a company called CPEX. CPEX is one of those companies that we, we couldn't have told a better story. So with a water pump that we created, we created a water pump that's long lasting and deep reaching. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. Uh, the core, the, the heart of the system is what you see here. These are rotors. These are a part of a water pump that goes into a, a part that's called, called a stator. And a rotor and stator works like a cork screw and a, and a wine bottle cork. When you pull it, it brings the water up. And so you're able to go to any depth that you want, and it lasts a very long time. There's, no, there's very few parts, it doesn't wear out. There's no 50 cent or $5 part to go bad to quit working. However, this part, when it's properly made, it'll last 20 or 25 years. If it's not made right, it'll last much less. Well, we just happen to have this partner, which is 45 minutes out of Columbus, who is extremely excited and very huge supporter and a great champion and has given significant company resources and research and development to creating an optimal design, which is essentially the heart of our water pump. <coughs> so speaking a little bit more of water pumps, you see here, uh, typically in the field you have uh, water pumps that displace water. So this is like a piston style pump. This is what typically you see when you think about a hand pump. These are places where electricity is not available, which is most of the world. They go down about 50 meters into the ground. Some pumps will go down to up to 100 meters. Uh, one thing to note is, a lot of times organizations, they'll go in and they'll go in and start drilling a well. The total cost of putting in a well can range from 10 to 20 to $30,000. But only a small slice of that is actually the hardware. So maybe a quarter of the price of that entire well is the actual hardware itself. So the majority of the cost is in drilling. And that's because of fuel costs getting out to the field, getting parts there, well, organizations, they only drill down to where their pump will quit working. And we all know you can go out in your backyard and you can dig in the ground and 20 feet in the ground and you get water. However, that's not clean water. It gets contaminated easily. And so you have to drill down to where the earth filters the water and gets a good aquifer. And it's able to refresh quick enough so that they can use this pump, which is typically 12 to 24 hours a day. And so you don't want the pump to ever, the well to ever run dry. And so you have to be able to drill deep enough to get into good enough aquifers so that, that refresh rate is high enough so that people have water all day long. Well, in a lot of places that doesn't happen because the pump physically won't go deeper. The physics of the pump stop working. And so they often stop at a certain depth. And so maybe when it's during the rainy season in a country, they'll have water. But it's the dry season, the water table drops just enough and they don't have water anymore. 
In a lot of cases, people are literally walking one to two miles to get water. And when we were in Malawi, in a village called Zalamondo, installed two of our life pumps in, in the first pilot with World Vision, this village was told that they weren't going to have a pump because they went and drilled. They drilled down to 50 meters, and that's where the pumps were working that they were using in Malawi. They were told they weren't going to get water. And so they were very disappointed. Everybody was sad. All, when, when you start drilling, it's a huge ordeal. All the kids, all the women, the village chief, they're all standing there watching for 12 hours, however long it takes to drill. And then all of a sudden the drill truck stops. And they say, sorry, we can't get water here. And the village is devastated. So it's really a, a tremendous problem for on a lot of levels. But it also cost about $5,000 to do that drilling. And so it's not only a huge disappointment, but it's a huge waste of resources. But they're doing the best they can. So they were told, we can't do this, sorry. They left. A couple days later, they got word that the life pump was coming, that they were going to be able to pilot that in Malawi. They went back and drilled at that same borehole, the same place that they went to drill first time. And they drilled down another 20 meters, 70 meters. And they hit good water. And so that's one of our, where one of our first pumps in Malawi went into. And so this village was literally ecstatic. They were just uh, singing and praising for 20 minutes when it first went in. And so that's the sort of thing that, that's really exciting for us. Now, we're not limited by 50 or 100 meters, but this pump can actually go to 150 meters, which essentially hits all the water that we're, known, that we're aware of in these developing countries. And so you're able to use this two women or two, women or two kids, which is typically the operation as typically the people in charge of the water. Uh, it's ergonomically correct and it's designed to last a very long time. Now, it's not just an engineering problem, as I mentioned in the beginning. It has to be the social cost, the business cost. So looking at how this works, it really takes a village committee, it takes a maintenance team, it takes uh, the village taking ownership over that water pump. So the pump can be installed, but then it has to be up to the village to be able to keep it maintained. So we designed it specifically so it lasts long enough and it's inexpensive enough to, re to repair that they're able to keep it maintained on their own budget. And these are a dollar a day type of families dollar a day families where you have three to 500 people in a village, they're able to collect enough money to where it keeps us sustainable. And so that's the model that we're moving towards with our NGO partners. By the way, we don't have boots in the ground. We go and work with field partners. We, we go help them install and train them and troubleshoot. But it's really the NGO partners who know the countries, know the culture, know the people. They have a long-term relationship. They'll work with the village for 20 years. We're just supporting those organizations. We're doing a part that they can't do. You see here the three different generations of water pumps that we've developed. The first generation is in the Central African Republic. This was a couple of years ago. This pump was uh, a great learning experience, which is code for it didn't work the way we wanted. <laughs> but once again, this is all volunteer work, <coughs> donated time, labor, materials, money. We were very pleased with what we did learn. But that also caught the attention of CPEX, which was one of the companies that's been a great partner. They helped us, they developed, they helped us develop the second generation here. And so the second generation you actually see on here, this is a remote monitoring device, the blue box. So that helps, this is something that we're working on and, and piloting and prototyping ourselves with some partners. A remote de monitoring device that will tell a base camp whether or not the pump is functioning or not, which is hugely valuable. Because communication is so terrible in the field to know in real time, is this pump work? is it working, is it healthy? Is it working the way it's supposed to be doing before it actually breaks? It's hugely valuable. And then the third generation pump, this is actually in Malawi in November when this first went in. That's with World Vision. This village was singing and praising and dancing for 20 minutes when this first started happening. They were getting water from an open well source. So this is an open well in the ground, about three or four foot in diameter, about six feet in the ground. And kids were climbing down into this well, scooping the water out. It, it was water, the way I describe it to people in America, it was water that you wouldn't even want to put your foot into. It was so dirty and they were drinking this. This was their normal way of life. And so to see water this clean coming out, they didn't even realize water could be that clean. So we're actually taking off what we call the 100 pump project where we're installing 100 pumps with various partners through World Vision in up to 10 different countries this year. And this is our large scale pilot. There's a lot of work that has to be done to make this work, but we're, along, we're quite a ways into it. We're very excited. We're going to be going to Zambia, Ethiopia, Mali, and Malawi to install the pumps initially, and then five more countries after that. 
So let me actually show a quick video again. We interviewed a lady named Vickness. Vickness is a, a mother. She works in a village. She, she lives in the village, I should say. And this was after the water pump was installed. support that number of villagers for their daily use for quite a number of years? The, the way they, the, the aquifers are usually tested is that it's, it's drilled down to where they think they, they're getting good water and then they have a test where they'll refresh, they'll pull the water out of the electric pump and see how quickly it refills and that gives them an indication of how long or how quickly it refills. As far as how many years, that I'm, I, I don't have a good I don't have good information on that as far as if it works today and would have worked in 20 years and still have water. I, I do know um, that a lot of, of, of the field experience is saying that water is getting deeper and deeper. So a lot of the so-called easy to reach water has been already done. And so the, the easy to reach water is, is easier to get, it's cheaper to get too. And the, the organizations, the water organizations are saying we've gotten most of the easy to reach water but it's getting deeper. And a lot of that's because of global warming, global change, things like that. Do you have more information about the, uh, the data analytic system, the data monitoring system, or that all that you mentioned the uh, CAR? Yeah, so so it's it's as far as how, how it's performing or how it's yeah, performance so what kind of data are you capturing uh, maybe yeah. estimated costs? So there's actually three different indicators on this one. So it's there's a, a depth indicator which is actually an indicator of whether the well is 
So there's pipes that make up the pump itself. Then there's a flow rate and there's a handle rotation. So we're collecting that data and transmitting it. And that was just a prototype there. Our, our cost, that's a satellite-based one too. So there's others that are doing cell-based technology, which is less expensive. Uh, I, the, the target price is one to $200, something somewhere in there. Uh, there's a lot of interest. I was just speaking with um, some, some of our volunteers about Google and how they've given a lot of money to Charity Water. We've done a lot of research with a few other organizations. But they're really kind of scratching the surface, and a lot of the organizations are really interested in the solution that for the long term. So we're, we're looking at one that pairs up with the light pump, but also other pumps. So we're, we're not as bold to say this is the only solution in the world. So if, if another pump works at a shallower depth, we're, we're more than happy to support that. I think you're first. So is your rotor an Archimedean screw? Essentially. That's, that's essentially the way it looks. It's a little bit different. The, if you have a, a well in the, in the country, in the United States, you would have the same, very similar type of pump, except for you'd have a little submersible motor on the end of it, and, and electricity going down to the bottom of the wall. Yeah. So it's really a proven technology. It's not brand new. It's, it's a proven technology, and some of these have been shown the, the last 20 or 30 years, which is, which is really exciting. Yeah. Do you know anything about the geochemistry down there? I'm just thinking of, say, Bangladesh, where you drill wells and then you get arsenic. Yeah. So. There, there's certainly those cases where, which are extreme and unfortunate. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some places where you, you do get arsenic and get bitter water that's not potable. Yeah. Uh, in most cases, that's not true. Okay. Yeah. The water's tested. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest issues is groundwater contamination in a well. So the way it's designed, it's, it's literally impossible to get groundwater and contaminate mm -hmm. things that might be around the top of the Yes? Um, can you just compare for the layman Education or outreach? 
as far as like, tackling the education problems? Exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to watch how the, tr the transition from not having clean water to having one opens up new possibilities. Yeah. I really like that. So, where does that lead you now, next? That's a tremendous challenge, and that's that's not what our, our stronghold is. Uh, but, but that's where working with partner organizations who do have that community development uh, expertise and, and ability uh, opens up the possibilities for opening a school where instead of kids gathering water for four hours a day and then being tired, they're able to go to school for four hours and then learn. And so it's kind of a crawl, walk, run mentality where the, the water is, is, I think, pretty universally understood that's the first, first step in the process. Uh, but then even looking at giving people hope and inspiration, I think is tremendously valuable. So if you have a village, not only does clean water you know, help their physical need, but they see that life does get better. And then they'll see other villages where life is getting better because of that, and they'll want that. And they'll start developing a little bit more income. They're able to save up. And usually it takes one or two generations to do so. But eventually, the poverty cycle is broken to the point where they end up sending their kid to school or even college, which which is uh, a really exciting thing. So I, I don't know. Yeah, as far as the our, our focus is on humanitarian engineering problem solving, and so really working with organizations who care about the educational component as well. So it's the complete package. It's not an organization that just goes in and put, puts in a pump and leaves. We, we won't work with those organizations. It's ones who are looking at the long term stability. And um, if I understood correctly, you're a 501 yeah. We are. Have you ever considered um, switching over to the So, so we, we consider ourselves a kind of a hybrid sort of, of social and enterprising. Uh, so one thing I didn't mention also is the, the water pumps and, and any future projects that might get to this level. Uh, we really want those to be sustainable in their own. So we're not, we don't want to subsidize what we're doing. We want it to be sustainable where an organization can buy it, install it, and that's cost effective for them. So otherwise, we're relying on our own fundraising abilities, which we're not fundraising experts. We're organizations that are fundraising experts, and so we'll let them do what they do well. Uh, and creating that income, we're allowed to create a certain amount of income as a 501c3 and, and pay for overhead expenses. After a certain point, then you can't do that, so it becomes a spin-off subsidiary. So very much our, our goal is to make this in the very, very beginning. This has to be self-sustaining. So after we pay the overhead of the people who are building these pumps and selling them, distributing them, then whatever profits go back into the, the nonprofit, which allow us to do more of the kind of 